All right, well, let's uh, talk about how the world views love. How's that song go? What the world needs now is love, sweet love. <laughs> what a corny song to start the session on. <laughs> Firstly, the world thinks, number one, that it knows what love is. I mean everyone in the world pretty much. Yeah. Most people in the world feel or think, I should say, that they know what love is. Very few people are really honest with themselves about it, but you listen to the average mother and she will certainly tell you she knows what love is. She's had children, she knows what love is. Microphone. Microphone. It's a loving thing because other can hear you. Did it's you see on YouTube, it's called The Cat and the Dolphin. There's a cat on a boat kissing and um, the dolphin and the cat are interacting yeah. and it's just the most perfect um, act of love that it's just really cute. If you look, it's called The Cat and the Dolphin. It was on... <laughs> <laughs> I've got it, I'll show you. And I don't YouTube. know whether that's love, actually. Yeah. Yeah. But anyway, we'll talk about it. <laughs> right, the world also thinks it knows what love feels like. Like. Isn't that not true? You know, love hurts. <laughs> and so forth, right? We, we think we know what love feels like. The world also think it knows, thinks it knows, what love does. If you see someone crying, love will always comfort, comfort them. them. Oh. <laughs> don't cry, don't cry. Don't cry, don't cry. I love you, I love you. Yeah, you don't need to cry. No? That's what the world does, isn't it, with love, one of the things. So when you think about all of that, if a person comes along on the earth and says, I'm sorry, but what you think love is, is not what it is. And a person says, if, and what you think love feels like, actually that's not love either. And if the same person says, and you know how you do these things thinking you're doing them because you love, and you're not doing them because you love, you're doing them for another reason, isn't that going to be quite confronting? Yeah. Yeah. And that's the issue we face on the earth today. Is that, is that the world already has a belief systems about love that are fully in place and have been established for many thousands of years, actually. Belief systems, these belief systems about love have been established for thousands of years. And people defend them ferociously, as you Which is an interesting oxymoron. Yeah. <laughs> the defense of love ferociously, isn't, isn't it? What is love? Yeah. Um, and... I don't know if it's the right place in the talk to talk about why that happens. <laughs> well, I, what I was going to do is start with what love is and then feels like and what it does. But I'm happy to, to take it any other way you want. <laughs> no, I think that's good. I was just going to make the point that I feel that people um, decide they know what love does, what it looks like, what it feels like, because they don't want to face that maybe what they felt in their childhood wasn't love. And so they hold on to that. that it's about the avoidance of our own pain in the end. So hold on to that and go, no, that is love and that's what I'm going to have with everyone else. And anyone who challenges that is actually challenging what I felt in my childhood, which I'd really like to feel is love, because if it wasn't love, that's going to hurt. And also, if anyone is challenging it, then they're automatically unloving. According to the definition. Yeah. So, so we want to see, first, one of the first things we need to see about love is there is a direct relationship between what we were taught love was from our own childhood and what we believe love to be. We need to understand that direct relationship. That whatever we were taught love to be in our environment as we were a child, so we often grow up and actually believe love to be, even though it may not be love. There are literally people on the planet who believe an abusive relationship is love. 
That's why they're in an abusive relationship. You know, many of you have heard of the battered wife syndrome, have you not? Where the woman is, is allowing herself to be beaten by her partner, but at the same time her partner tells her that, she loves, that he loves her and she believes that. Why does that happen? Well, something has to have happened in her childhood for her to accept that untruth. So, so what we want to do is start confronting in, within ourselves as an idea. This is again an idea of investigation. My, my suggestion as an investigation in your own life is to start looking at what the world believes love is and then ask yourself, you know, if I was really open-minded here in my investigation of love, would I believe love is that actually or is it not that? And the same goes with what love feels and what love does. Right. Now, if love, I put to you, if love is the most powerful force in the universe and if love, if we have this viewpoint that love is always painless, in other words, love is always without pain, so let, let me present that as an idea, love <coughs> is never... Painful. Gotcha, gorgeous. <laughs> right, so love is never painful. Is that two L's? No. One L. One L in Australia, two L's elsewhere. Um, so love is never painful. I'll put that to you as an idea. That love is never painful. And this is a very important idea to experiment with. How much, by the way, how much does that mess up everything that yeah. we've thought is love like in the past? Right. I've heard, I quite often hear from people, um, oh, but that's what happens when you're in love, isn't it? Sometimes it's quite painful. Sometimes it hurts. No. Never. Never hurts. Love never hurts. Real love never hurts. It's never painful. Now, as a concept in itself, it's a very powerful concept to consider, isn't it? Can you see? Because that means every time I've had pain in a relationship of any kind, then love wasn't its cause. It means that something else was its cause other than love, if this is true. You see, and this is where if we have this open scientific sort of investigative nature, we can consider this as a potential possibility that love is never painful. And if we go down that track, every time that I feel pain from love, I do not understand what love is. Can you see the relationship? If I, if I believe that, then every time I have pain, it mustn't be love anymore. It must be something else. Is everyone following me so far? Yeah? Now, if love is never painful, then how much goes out the window with what the world's view of love feels like that most of the songs how do they go <laughs> like a, you know the Roy Orbison song love hurts what other ones can come to your mind sorry what other ones there's plenty of them isn't there sacrifice yeah sacrifice for love I will do anything for love <laughs> <laughs> right is that true too it, would love do anything for love? W would love lie? Well, that song says yes. That love would lie for somebody. Huh? There's another Brian Adams song that goes, I would lie for you, I'd die for you. Yeah, well, that, you remember those songs? Like, that's what we view love to be. And, and, you know, Brian Adams has made millions of dollars from those records, by the way, which means that many of his listeners and, and the people who listen to the songs believe, yeah, that is true. That, that is true, that, that that's what I would do for love, right? Well, when um, about a year or so ago, my brother launched a uh, fairly vicious attack upon AJ and myself on the internet. And um, I spoke to my dad about it and he said, well, there's love in what he's doing there, Mary. And I even went to talks and people went, yeah, it's pretty nasty what your brother's saying, but I can tell he loves you. <laughs> Like, how is a person swearing about your partner loving you? Attacking your way of life, loving you. How does that work? You see, 
we go, oh, but love is motivating that. I'm sorry, I can't agree. Love doesn't motivate that behaviour. It's another emotion. It's an addiction of some kind and some other emotion motivating that kind of behaviour. It's never love. Because love would never even con contemplate doing that. But on the earth, it's fairly <laughs> common that we go, oh, no, that's love. You know, you do that when you love someone in your family, you'll do anything to, to help them. Uh, and we, people excuse a lot of very negative behaviour, calling it love. Mm. Um, that's how rife the acceptance on the planet is, that uh, it's OK to be ang You can be angry and loving. You can be abusive and loving. You can, yeah. Now, obviously, the man who's beating his wife is taking that to an extreme, is he not? Because he, he believes he loves his wife and he says often to her, oh, but I really love you, you know, but he's beating her, for goodness sake. Like, like that's taking this concept that, that I can do anything for love uh, to the extreme. Why would he beat her? Because basically he's jealous and jealousy obviously isn't love. Maybe he's trying to control her. Is control love? No, it's not love. And she said, and yet we accept on this earth today, we accept so many beliefs that the world has about love without question. Right? <coughs> so my suggestion is to experiment with this concept in, in your life, in your day-to-day -day life. The experiment with the concept that love is never painful and every time I feel some pain, then I don't understand love in that particular moment. Does that make sense to everyone? Just experiment with that. Now, when I started experimenting with that myself in this life, um, it was amazing how many things I realised I was doing that was, was actually inconceived, that where I did not conceive love correctly. Right? So, for example, I was living in a relationship shortly before I had this realisation and, and the, the lady in the relationship che cheated on me on a number of occasions. So she had sex with another person. Now, I had huge amounts of painful feelings about that. Right? And yet, once I had this realisation, I was going, wow. Why then did I have all these painful feelings about her cheating on me? And in fact, when you even think of the words, cheating on me, you start to see what your belief system is, actually, with regard to love. You see, Love is never painful, so if I really loved her, even her having sex with somebody else would not actually cause me to feel pain. I might not be with her anymore because of my choice to only have a monogamous, monogamous relationship with one person, which is my desire, but I would not be in terrible pain about it. Does that make sense to everyone? So the fact that I was in terrible pain about it meant that it wasn't love for her that I was feeling. What was it? It's a good question. Any idea? Well, there must be some kind of addiction. So let's start with the fact that it's a classification of an emotion called it <laughs> addiction. <laughs> uh, so it's an addiction of some kind. It was an addiction to prevent an emotion, uh, some other emotions that I was having. What emotions would you have if your partner cheated on you? Fear. What would the fear be? Nobody loves me. Fear, fear that no one loves you? So there'd be fear or a feeling that nobody loves me? Yeah. So betrayal? Good. Retray, why? While. <laughs> I think I need to write today. Mary's the speller yeah. <laughs> in the two halves of it. Um, sorry. Uh, rejection? Unworthiness. Why would I feel unworthiness? I'm not, good enough. Not good enough. I'm not good enough for them to want me. They want someone else. Um, humiliation. humiliation? Good. What about sexually? Can you see it's a sexual rejection, isn't it? So how does that make you feel when you're sexually rejected? Unattractive. Unattractive? Inadequate. Inadequate sexually? Mm. 
Can you see just by just by starting to list a few of the other emotions? Now, do any of these emotions seem like love to you? Can you see? They are actually the sources of my pain. These emotions are the sources of my pain. And isn't it true that these emotions exist already within me and I actually want this woman to love me... In quotations. In quotations, in order to prevent... Avoid those emotions. ...all of these emotions. Can you see? Does that make sense? Yep. So, so, so when... When she had this infidelity to our relationship, I go into all of these emotions of feeling humiliation, unattractive, inadequate, unworthy, reject, felt like a rejection, a betrayal, not so much me, it didn't feel like so much for some reason. But there was just a long list of these other emotions. Every single one of these emotions were already within me as a pain before I even entered the relationship, ironically, and of course that would make sense. And because I did not want to feel those emotions, I wanted her to love me, in other words, be faithful to me, so that I don't have to feel those emotions. Right? Now, once I've felt all of those emotions, I, could, I felt love for the woman again. But I, I didn't want to be with her anymore, but I felt love for her again. And I also realised that it's actually, if, if I was in a relationship with somebody else, I realised that actually they could actually cheat on me and I would not feel any of those things. Does that make sense? I wouldn't feel all of those things anymore. And because of that, for the first time in my life, I would actually be loving. <laughs> because... Love is never painful. It's never going to result in a painful experience. And also, it never places an expectation, does it? On another person. Or a demand, or a desire that this person t take away something for me, or give me something so I avoid a hole in me. So and what I realised in that moment was that the pain was not caused by love. It was caused by all of these other feelings I had about myself that I was unwilling to feel about myself and I wanted somebody else to make them all go away. And that's what I realised. And for most of us, the greatest love affairs of our life are when somebody like takes away like a massive amount of our core emotions for us, helps us avoid the, our massive injuries. Like, do you know what Mary means uh, by that? Uh, do, do you understand that what Mary means is if they satisfy our addictions to not feel those emotions, then we feel that was a fantastic relationship. And for some, for some of us, it just has to be one or two really core emotions that are big within us. And if a person comes along and takes, stops us, prevents us feeling those feelings, like uh, in one of my relationships, two key emotions I wanted to avoid are uh, being unworldly. In other words, feeling that other people in the world didn't think you were cool. I'm not cool, I don't know stuff. I'm unworldly and unattractive, physically. That's it. This guy came along, made me feel very worldly and, sudden, and very physically attractive, and it was the biggest love affair of my life. Not this and guy. <laughs> <laughs> Another one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, another one. <laughs> but I thought, oh, now I know what love is. Oh, I've finally fallen in love. This is amazing. I want to spend the rest of my life with this person. All of these things. And eventually the relationship broke down. He ended the relationship. I was heartbroken. And two or three years later, I look back and I go, wow. I, yeah, I didn't find that attractive about him. I didn't find this attractive. I, ooh, ooh. Actually, I don't quite like that even at all about him. But I was so blinded by the fact that I did no longer felt these two big emotions for me that I thought it was like magical love. And it's scary to me, actually, where I might have ended up in my life had he felt, had I been fulfilling some massive addiction for him, because we would have ended up in a marriage, probably, that was based only on these two things. Me, it was like, like, like a fix, <laughs> having, for the first time in my life, not feeling unworldly or unattractive. Yeah. So can you see how powerful it is? Like, yeah. just an addiction can cause us to fall in love with a person. And once we have that addiction met, 
over and over and over again we think this is a wonderful relationship it feels wonderful to us we've got the addiction met over and over and over again right and yet in reality it's just a person who's willing to satisfy our addiction right? and in a way how can we have a true connection because if say that man was AJ and he was helping me avoid these two emotions I'm, he's actually helping me avoid a core part of myself and so in this relationship I, I'm asking yes please keep giving me that so that I don't have to feel bad so I'm completely in suppression of who I am still mm. um, and perhaps I'm doing that for you in the relationship and as even well. more important you're never going to grow towards God because of course God requires you to be real yep and if you're not being real that you've got those two emotions then you, you know, you're further away from God than if you're real about it yeah uh -huh. and it's very beautiful can I say to now be in a relationship where I can feel these things and feel in connection with someone and feel loved in that process but initially I didn't feel loved I thought this other thing was love and it felt very confronting to actually feel those emotions even in the presence of AJ because I thought well if you can see this about me you can't love me so when myself and Mary first met with this emotion like you, she's meeting a guy who's saying he's Jesus that's not cool right <laughs> trust me it's definitely not cool <laughs> Mary knows this it's definitely not cool so 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 I'm not cool and what I'm saying is not cool and and then well, what uh, you're saying is pretty cool but well, well yeah. yeah I'm not cool though. Yeah. and and because I'm not cool then anybody who looks at us together will automatically feel that Mary's not cool does that make sense and so for Mary this emotion came up time and time again didn't it darling like yeah and and ironically also Mary had many beliefs about me because of that emotion that I that I'm not at that time so mm -hmm. so at that time she would think that I would do one thing and I'm going why do you think that I, I, I don't feel like doing that at all you know like and uh, there were lots of criticisms about what I would or would not do based on morals weren't there as well like yeah. what was morally what I felt was <laughs> morally correct and my morals weren't worldly either right so so I never so my, my set of belief systems are like with regard to morals very much connected to one person uh, in terms of not sharing uh, their energy any sexual energy with anybody else and that's not a cool thing nowadays is it really the cool thing is to flirt a bit and and so forth you know that's usually what people feel is cool you know and so that's also unworldly but even just the statement that I'm Jesus is an unworld you know because a not very cool so yeah. that had a big effect for me. on Mary yep. Yep. so can you see how just one of these emotions no longer getting met instantly triggers our beliefs about love but straight away we start thinking oh that's not love so Mary when she was feeling like I wasn't making her feel worldly then she automatically felt I wasn't loving her and oh heaps safe safe he should make me feel safe if a man loves me he makes me feel safe that was a huge one as well so if, um, so because quite often we'd get together we'd be together and uh, a group of people would come around and we'd talk together right now that group of people would ask us questions about our life in the first century instantly Mary felt unsafe as soon as she felt unsafe the, there was a series of things Mary used to do hey well can yeah. you I just try and detune from the, the situation then I'd try get distract make a cup of tea all of these things to try and get away from what's happening and if none and of those things worked, I'd get angry yeah. I'd just go I don't want to talk about this they're not even interested you know that was the feeling coming from me yeah and it's, it was triggering all of the terror that I'm actually now experiencing with the big media drama yeah uh, um, but my expectation on AJ I would always get angry at him because my expectation was that he make me safe if he loved me he and I'd would be going but, but, but I'm just answering their questions <laughs> yeah. you know what I mean yeah. uh, but but the feeling is that I'm not making Mary safe so therefore I'm the unloving person mm. right because if my beliefs are the man will make me safe and that's what love does can you see straight away I'm going to start getting that confronted and I've had some very beautiful realizations since about how how beautiful love really is like love actually desires that I that I am truly myself so if I feel unsafe love would 
a desire that I f experience that, that I would allow that to just, I would just be myself. And um, AJ giving me the gift of actually being open to me feeling unsafe, being open to me feeling all of these things, whereas a lot of other people are not open to you, are not loving, they're not open to you feeling how you really feel. Mm. Uh, what a gift that actually is. Mm. But it took a long time to break down this idea of what love really does. Yeah. So uh, getting, and I want to harp back onto this because it's really important concept that's worth experimenting with in your life as much as you possibly can on a day-to-day -day basis. You see, almost every relationship we have has a degree of pain in it, generally. So for many of you, there is degrees of pain in your relationship with your parents that you don't want to face. There's degrees of pain in relationship with your children that you don't want to face. There's degrees of pain in your relationship with your partners that you don't want to face. And what I'm suggesting to you is that if you can, if you can come to face them, those pains, you will discover what love really is. Because, because when you get to the point where it's no longer painful, now you've discovered love. Because that's the point. That's the point where that this belief disappears. This, this, sorry, this belief becomes true. The belief that love is painful disappears. Right? And my suggestion is if you experiment with that as much as possible in your life, like in your day-to-day -day interactions. Now, if you do that, you'll find you'll confront every relationship very rapidly. Right, where you'll start seeing what's going on between between the two, the, two, the two of you in the relationship, and it doesn't have to be just the partnership or the the sexual relationship that you have, but rather every relationship that you have, the relationship you have with people at work, your friends, your family, your children, your parents, every single person, there is generally some pain associated with the relationship. And if you can work through what that pain is, you'll discover more about love. Because love is never painful. So you're obviously going to let go of things that create your pain. If we just have the mic. Go. Um, I've actually been experiencing this um, today. And my question is, is that um, I've just realised that what I thought was love isn't love. And when I separated the two... I'm not feeling pain, I'm feeling really empty, like a, 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 like a blob of nothing. And if I don't attach to that feeling of significance or th if I don't attach to that, then I, I, there's no pain there. It's, the, it's, just, it's just empty, like I don't even know who I would be without that false belief. Yes. Yep. And this is what's very confronting about this, uh, you know, this belief without the never, love is painful. The beauty of that belief is it helps you maintain facades with each other, with, with relationships and everything else. It keeps you in a state of addiction. And then when you begin to drop it, you become so afraid because, because you don't, most of us don't really know what love is. I want to know what love is. <laughs> and then we go... But I want you to show me. You know, like we, we want somebody else to to do the work, right? About it, and and that's how it is with a lot of our, our life. We 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 feel that we want somebody else to to show us what love is, which brings me to the next thing that we can confront. The next thing that we confront is love is never. Big bold, demanding. <coughs> Love is never demanding. Mm. That's an interesting one, isn't it, to experiment with? Because uh, it's amazing how many times um, uh, demand creates anger in us, actually. Have you noticed that? Look, when you have a demand upon a person, when that demand is not met, you instantly feel angry. Most people are like that. I remember having a discussion with John before he passed, and a friend, my friend John, who is the actual Apostle John, but I had a friend, a friend when I discussed these things with him, I, I talked to him about his anger. What was happening is we were, we were he'd, he'd invited a group of the 14, there were seven or eight of us together, 
it's the only time there's been seven or eight of us together actually um, to his house to spend some time together right a month or so it was together he invited us there and I said Sh you sure John because you know what it's like when people come to your house and you know he had this beautiful botanical garden uh, that he'd set up from, pretty much from scratch and he'd done a lot of work on that and when people come to his house he likes everything pristine and nice and neat and so forth and I said you know what it's like you know we're going to have extra people there and it's going to be quite confronting for them emotionally and do you really want to bite that off in your own house right and he goes yep yep definitely want to do that so about two days in to everyone being there he walks into the kitchen and he finds Luke, one of the others of the 14, laying on the kitchen floor crying. <coughs> and he steps over him <laughs> and goes, I wish you would do that somewhere else. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> and, um, and he was really, really upset about it. Like, I can't even walk into my own kitchen without somebody being upset like on the floor and taking my space right and that you can see as soon as there's the demand that somebody does something then straight away we are instantly in an unloving place you follow me and so and I was saying to John but now right at that moment that you stepped over Luke and said go and do this somewhere bloody else I think he said to him and um, he, as soon as he did that he was actually now in a place where he was demanding Luke do something different than what he was doing and could you say <coughs> even before that he had an expectation demands always begin with expectations actually so therefore we could also say love is never expecting or cool. having expectations yep. right? So, so whenever I have an expectation of you to treat me a certain way, I am automatically unloving. Now that's a very, very different concept to what people think on the earth, isn't it? We go, oh, I married the man. I signed a piece of paper. We are married. <laughs> he has to never cheat on me. Huh? That's an expectation. It's automatically unloving. Right? Now I'm not saying that I would live with a person who cheats on me. Right? But having the expectation that a document that he signed proves that he should not cheat on you is actually a very unrealistic expectation. But not only that, it's also unloving. Because love is never having expectations and is never demanding. Do we have a mic back? I just have a question, well, yeah, a question slash statement. <laughs> um, I'm actually experiencing like a really good, uh, one of my best friends, um, very, very close person to me and I absolutely love her dearly, but um, I find that it, like it's funny because now that you bring it up like just through you know through history and beliefs in society of what love is supposed to be mm -hmm. um, I have sacrificed a lot of my own happiness for the sake of our relationship because I believe that that sacrifice was said to be love um, and I found that in return like I have a lot of anger like towards her because she has caused me a lot of pain and she has also, it's always expectations and it's always been and I never could understand why do you always have expectations of me, you know? And she would be like, well, you know, it's because I love you. Well, can, I, can I correct a few things though? Yeah. She has not caused any of your pain. I, yeah. It is your own <laughs> belief systems that cause the pain. And I, I, I'm aware. Does yeah. that make sense? <laughs> but, but you did bring up a very interesting thing, another thing that I wanted to mention actually about love. Love never never sacrifices mm -hmm. ain't that a confronting idea for the earth what are we taught mothers are taught that's what it means to be a mum you've got to sacrifice you know and and everybody in fact is taught this sacrifice in fact you look at my life what's that been about according to Christianity it's the sacrifice. And what did yeah? it prove? That he loved us. And it proved that I loved you. Mm. Or God loved you. 
that he gave me his only begotten son right for your sacrifice but the truth is that love never sacrifices why does it why does it need to love is the pinnacle of your existence it never needs to sacrifice at all so how often do we then assume that when I'm making a sacrifice for another person that I'm being loving it's the pain of those sacrifices that you're now feeling does that make sense because the sacrifice in itself caused you to have to detune from your own passions and desires during the sacrifice and anybody who demands a sacrifice from you is being doubly unloving because firstly they're being demanding which is not loving but secondly they don't understand that love doesn't sacrifice yeah. if we could just put the mic back that's good um, I was just saying like you know being at the stage that it's at now you know obviously this this anger that of course was caused by myself and my own um, actions well no it's been well, caused by a number of things including yeah. the fact that she demanded it yeah does it make sense um, how do you deal with it now like how do you well remember <laughs> anger covers your addictions which cover your fears which cover your grief so if you can allow yourself to get to the grief of the of the whole like the life or some of your life being spent fulfilling the emotions of others and sacrificing yourself in the process if you can feel that grief then you'll rele release it from you and ironically at that time you'll also forgive her for her demands yep. okay because this is part of the point about love never being painful, isn't it? Mm -hmm. If we have pain in a relationship, it's because I'm not in a state of love. So I have something to heal. Mm -hmm. And uh, very often we go, yeah, it's painful because you're kicking me. <laughs> and therefore, this isn't love. But we don't recognize that if I'm feeling pained or angered about it, there's something that I haven't healed inside of me. Yeah. So, um, But look at the reason why you thought love equals sacrifice. Because there's obviously a family belief about that and why you were willing with this one person to make a lot of sacrifices what did you want in return for that was it the love and approval of a woman do you feel like you never had love and approval from women or you know just begin to question how did this evolve in my life what emotions led me to think that love is sacrifice and I will sacrifice for this person yeah yep. okay thank you now there's another thing I'd like to present about love love is not what do you reckon I might say <laughs> just relax for a moment because you're, you're all feeling under pressure now so just relax just relax so far you've seen the love isn't pa painful it's not demanding it doesn't sacrifice not <laughs> sorry not I disagree completely <laughs> it is definitely very romantic <laughs> it's not hard I don't know whether I'd agree with that either particularly it, see the hardness depends on the environment doesn't it can you see like if, if, if our environment is very unloving, then to be loving is very hard. But How, if our environment yeah. is very loving, to be loving would be very easy. Yeah. Yeah. How many people found it difficult to maintain a space of love when there was one, two, three, four, five media reports, uh, so, some of you personally implicated in them, uh, about AJ, to, to stay in a state of love with the people who presented the, the material? That, that's pretty... That was... Shall I help you? Just. Love is not justice. So the two things are separate from each other. All right. Now, can I illustrate this or even prove this to you through just a little bit of logical discussion? Now, let's say I'm, uh, I'm, I'm an Israeli. And Mary Palestinian. is a Palestinian. And Mary has her family, and I have my family. And one of her family, well, let's say one of my family, 
happens to be in the Israeli army. And he's got his gun loaded with bullets and one time, because of some anger of other people, he happens to pull the trigger. And one of Mary's children dies as a result of that action. Now, almost every religious form on this planet says that love would demand justice. How do you even up the score with a death? Well, according to the Bible, the way you even it up is an eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, life for a life. The Koran says much the same. Agreed? So Mary decides to take it in her hands to now, oh, of course it was an eye for an eye, she would have to kill one of my children, wouldn't she? Does that feel like a loving act to you? Now that's taken to an extreme, right? Isn't it? Taking a death for a death. But let's uh, rewind it. We see it a lot in relationships. Right? So let's say I cheat on Mary in the relationship. So in other words, I have a sexual liaison outside of our relationship. Mary feels that justice is demanded. It's a high likelihood if she feels that of what would she perhaps do? Go out and have her own affair. Or just project rage at you Or just project rage years. at me for 20 years. <laughs> That's justice as well, right? <laughs> one of the two, it's fine. Right? And I put to you that none of those things are loving. Right? Now you see the problem with justice is, is that justice is what we revert to when we don't love. I'll say that again actually. Justice is what we revert to when we don't love. Because love has an, some other qualities. We'll talk about, we've talked about in the past what love is, but here we're talking about what it's not. Because what we're trying to do is help you see that these are belief systems that are on this planet. It's what the world thinks it knows about love. This is what the world thinks. If you take away the nevers and the is nots, right, and you replace it with love is painful, that's what the world believes. And if you replace this with love is demanding, that's what the world believes. And love has expectations, that's what the world believes. And it, love is sacrifice, is what the world believes. And love is just, is what the world believes. And I'm saying to you that actually none of those things are love. And you can experiment with this, actually, in your own life to see whether these things feel loving to you. Now, this one's really easy to experiment with. This love is not justice. Many of you have already experimented with it in your childhood. You know, your brother or sister came up and gave you a whack. And what did you do in return many times? Give them a whack back. <laughs> and that felt good perhaps, right? but was it loving? No, well, I put to you what actually happened was your brother did not love you when he belted you and then when you tried to get some justice you didn't love him either in that process. Right? And the problem with this kind of thinking that love is just, as Gandhi said, it makes the whole world blind because you know, eye for an eye makes the whole world blind. Sooner or later, you're going to offend somebody else, you're going to hurt somebody else. Sooner or later, we all make mistakes until we're perfect. We're going to offend or hurt somebody else in the process of taking actions. And then if they can't forgive, and then they hurt us in return, and then we escalate the violence, then of course, sooner or later, we're going to start losing limbs. And this is what is actually physically happening on the planet. There are people right at this moment losing their life or limbs as a result of this thinking, that love is justice. It doesn't work. We've got to give up this false belief that the world thinks it, it knows. And could I, can I talk about that point yeah. a little bit? Because for me, this is such a beautiful thing. When I met AJ, I was pretty addicted to the belief that love is justice and there's so much injustice and that proved there's no love. And in fact, the fact that there is 
unjust things happening does show that there's not a lot of love on the planet. But I thought that love must equal justice. Or that love and, should equalise the injustice. Exactly, yeah. yeah. Um, but what I've learned is the power of what love actually does. Because if you think about it, God loves all of us. And we haven't always been just or good in our life. But when we receive that love, um, and when I have received that love, it is an, an amazing um, softening that happens inside of me to know that you're loved when you're not perfect. And uh, in my experience, when we have groups and people are angry uh, at us, or even... Um, in our day-to-day -day life when someone does something that feels very unjust to me, that I haven't provoked it and suddenly I'm receiving an attack. I used to become very rigid against that and try and protect myself. Uh, now I'm practicing softening and opening into that place and sometimes it feels fearful, but at the same time I feel love there. I, I feel an ability and a capacity to love them. And so often I'm just overwhelmed again and again by the power of loving someone who isn't in a loving space. And to me, this is what God is teaching us. If AJ's in a really unloving place and instead of punishing him for that, I actually love him. I, it has the power to completely soften him. Many times people who aren't in loving spaces have never experienced love. And so to display love to them um, very often opens them and it teaches them that they can be loved. Mm. Um, I'm finding it hard to explain. But it's like in but that example that Mary gave, if I want to hurt Mary and then Mary just hugs me, which is really what a loving feeling feels like in a lot of cases, just uh, like a hug. How hard is it for me to continue on with my desire to hurt her? It's much more difficult. But if I want to hurt Mary and Mary goes, oh, you want to hurt me, I'm going to bop you in the nose first and wax me one. How e hard is it for them, how hard or easy is it for them for me to go and whack her back? Much easier, isn't it? Can you see? And for me it is... Um, I'm trying so hard to explain it and I feel emotional about it as well but um, it's the difference for me between self-reliance and God-reliance uh, or one of the differences. When I was very invested in justice I wanted to see it done you know I wanted to make sure people were loved and things bad things didn't happen and um, by allowing God into my life, I learn what it's like to be loved when I'm not loving, but also I have more trust that God can love other people as well and they can grow just as I'm growing and I don't have to fix it. <laughs> you know, God has a, a much grander capacity to love and if I give up on justice, I allow an opening for that. So you also, <laughs> when you gave up on justice, you were no longer self-reliant. Yes. So it's maybe the self-reliance that makes me want justice. Yeah. yeah. So maybe if we give an example, when we first met, one of the first things that we did was we went shopping together. <laughs> for food. Grocery shopping. For groceries. Right. And um, what happened was uh, um, I said uh, we'd, we'd been developing a friendship over three or four months and then Mary came along to the uh, UK and I was staying in the UK and what I did is I got this two bedroom house that where Mary could have a different bedroom and, and we could just get to know each other a bit right so the, one of the first things that happened as soon as we got to the place was we needed to go shopping so we went shopping so we go shopping and I'm walking this is the UK right a lot of fruit and vegetables in the UK come from Israel Israel so, so I'm walking through, going, it's going kind of my normal thing, and ching, 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 ching. You know, like, Mary looks at it. This is from Israel. Now, Mary has lived two and in, and a half, for two, two and a half years in Lebanon. In a Palestinian refugee camp. In a Palestinian refugee yeah. camp. Learning about the human rights injustices against Palestinians in Israel. <laughs> First hand, mind you. First hand. Yeah. Seeing the results of it, Mary's working as an occupational therapist in that environment with the direct results of this injustice. And there I am, <laughs> the very first time we were together really, it was pretty much the first day it was, that we, we caught up with each other face to face again after three or four months uh, just talking and, and discussing. 
and I'm putting in Israel goods in my shopping. Now Mary, in her humanitarian mode, seeking justice for the world, has boycott Israel stickers on all of her bags because that's my way of lovingly showing that I don't support the, the uh, politics of that region. And so this is my way of doing something that's not violent but that I'm saying I don't want to do this. I don't want to support them. Yeah. Okay, so, so what does Mary do about this? This is a major problem. <laughs> Right. Yeah, I do a few things here. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Demand expect. <laughs> so, so what happened was that I'm saying to Mary, darling, look, it's not loving to boycott things. And I'm saying it's not violence. I'm doing. I'm making a decision where my dollar goes. So, so what happens now is there's people in Israel that are not going to benefit from the sale of their goods, just like there's people in Palestine that haven't. Does that sound like justice to you? Well, yes, it does sound like justice, but is it love? Not really, right? I'm actually creating hardship for another group of people <laughs> as well as the first group of people. Now, what love would try to do is actually help the first group of people without creating hardship for the second group of people. <laughs> you follow me? So the fact is that it's not loving. Anyway. It was quite a long discussion yes. in, the, in the shopping centre. And, and Mary, <laughs> Mary went around very cross for the rest of the shopping trip. And you were challenging a core belief. <laughs> and I was challenging a core belief about love in her mm -hmm. in that moment. Just a simple act of putting a thing in the trolley <laughs> challenges our belief systems about love. But it, it demonstrates my self-reliance. This is how I'm going to fix this problem uh, rather than how can I love everyone in this situation because that's what God is doing. Mm. Yeah. So does a pedophile deserve your love? The answer is yes. Now that's pretty hard for a lot of people, isn't it? You look at what we normally do with a pedophile. What do we normally do? We ostracise them, criticise them, separate them, like them to be in jail and we'd like to cut off their genitals as well. That's as far as many of us go in terms of a pedophile. But they actually deserve our love. They deserve so much love actually from us that they deserve being placed in some kind of programs that will actually help them find the reason why they're a pedophile and to actually work through that group of emotions. That's how much love they deserve from us. And this is how much... God, you know how we often draw the spheres, you know? There's the first sphere and down there is the hells and the second and the third and the fourth and the fifth and all the way up. Yes, the hells are an unattractive, not a nice place to be in and they reflect the soul condition of that person who's living there. But God actually... Where do most celestial spirits spend most of their time? These are people who are at one with God and reflecting God's love. Most of them spend most of their time in the hells. God has so much love for these people who ha have sinned and erred and are struggling to know what love is, but God desires that they know love so much that the majority of celestial spirits spend most of their time in the hells trying to assist people to know what love is, to learn what it is. Yeah. So hopefully this discussion today, and we could go a lot further with what love isn't and what, what love would never do. And, and you, in fact, might want to experiment with making a list for your own self like as to what you believe love should do and compare that you know, with some, some very radical thinking about love. And my suggestion, even if, if you look at those four things and have taken note of them and when we put them on the net that you write them down or something, and then tr just try to experiment with that in your life in some way. Like, experiment with the pain. Like, okay, I'm feeling pain about this relationship. Like, my mum rang me up and she was condescending to me. And I put down her phone and I'm going, there she goes again. I feel a bit upset bit angry with her for being condescending towards me, annoyed with her, thinking, oh, gee, I don't want to ring her now for another couple of weeks at least, you know, until I calm down, all those feelings. So I'm feeling some pain. So what's, what's underneath the pain? I'm expecting my mother to not be condescending. Why? Because I want her to make me feel better about myself. So what does that mean? It means that I actually feel quite bad about myself. Yeah, probably my mum was part of the cause of that because she's obviously been condescending with me all of my life. How does that feel? And to go through those emotions and get to the point where when mum rings up and she's condescending, you don't have a feeling of pain. 
you go, Mum, you're just condescending again. But you don't feel pain because of it anymore. Right? Can you see, we can just experiment with our relationships in this way, like experiment with these, with these theories, if you like. These are the things the world is saying is fact. Like they're saying love is painful, love is demanding and expecting. Love Definitely always sacrifices. sacrifices. Like love is justice. That's what the world is saying to you constantly, every day. You, you'll see it in the media every day. You'll see it in your day-to-day -day life every day with interactions between your family and your friends and everything. You'll see these, these concepts every day and yet logically they make no sense whatsoever. And therefore, it's what the world thinks is love but it is not love. And we need to come to terms with the fact that it's not love. What we've been taught love is, is not what love is. Yeah, and, and I agree, you know, Laurie brought up earlier about just feeling like uh, almost disorientated. Like, <coughs> if that's not love, what is love? And I don't know what my life is about then. And I've certainly been through that process of feeling exactly that. Um, but now I feel so passionate about what love is and um, my desire to be loving or, you know, feeling much more connected to the truths about love. Mm. Um, and I had to go through this horrible process of, like, feeling angry. I felt angry every time these things were confronted in my day-to-day -day life because they were what, you know, made me feel safe and all these things. Mm. Um, but can now... I, can I provide know. another really simple example in our life that I just remembered? Was yeah. When we were over in New Zealand, and we had to pay excess baggage. Yeah. <laughs> you remember that? Yeah. It was so funny that was, oh, I thought. Yeah. Um, yep. you, can, yep. you can go with it. A bit. Uh, we're, oh, <laughs> so many things. We were standing in line um, flying. We had a domestic flight in New Zealand. We, we did a trip there last year. And it was and delayed. It was delayed flight. One of them had been cancelled. There was people queued up. Everyone was feeling a bit overwrought and um, we got to the the check-in we'd flown over okay no excess baggage and suddenly I'd put an extra couple of books and we always have the pageant messages so it's heavy in the bag and they were charging you know $15 in New Zealand over a kilo so it was two kilos that was 30 bucks or something and and I was like stop I'll just take the book out I'll just find it in the bag and I'll take the book out I'll unpack and AJ's like babe this is really not loving. I'm like, that's $30, you know? People have given us $30. We need to respect the gift. Blah, blah, blah. The value of money, that's the loving thing. He's like, this is not loving. You're not being loving to this person behind the counter who's serving us, the people who are waiting behind us. You're not being loving to me. I'd like to go and sit down. But I, I had this huge... Um, injury as it turns out <laughs> from my family about what is loving to do with money you know you must value every cent you have if you don't that's like mm. almost a sin against humanity <laughs> and I, I was so upset wasn't I and I felt this I was panicked I'm like I don't know what's the right thing to do with money if this is not the right thing to do with money I don't know how to deal with money in my life anymore and it was interesting when Mary went into that fear because she we, we actually I, I paid the $30 <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and I said, don't worry about it, babe. Now, Mary then got angry with me for, for embarrassing her in the process. So I just said, well, let's go and deal with that. So we, we sat down. And it was interesting where Mary got with it emotionally, which is very interesting because many of you are yet to go through this emotion, actually, with, with money. She got to the point where she felt that if this wasn't the way to use money, then she felt that she didn't know how to live her life even properly it was a terror I was shaking yeah. because her family has this very rigid view about that's the way you must use money and so it confronted so many beliefs that for the next couple of days there were emotions coming up for you about it weren't they where you had realizations after realization about what love would do yeah. we, we looked at the, there was about 200 or so people in the line behind us that would have had to wait for Mary to yeah, unpack the bags bag. right and find the books and then repack and so forth and the last lady in front of us obviously you imagine you've got 200 angry customers all have had their flights delayed or, or cancelled um, and and you're the you're the customer service officer behind the counter you imagine how much projecting you're already getting and then you have a person 
in the front repacking because of thirty dollars. Like you know, that's so you can imagine the lady behind the counter. She was also pretty upset with the whole thing, of course. So so, the, but the beauty is that when Mary went through the, it emotionally. It was amazing the emotions that came out about beliefs about the family, beliefs about accepting the family's viewpoint of money, beliefs about money itself and what's the right use of money and so forth. There were just like heaps and heaps of beliefs that came up in that moment. And, and you can see how if it's loving, right, then, then all of a sudden we start confronting the unloving belief systems. Once you, once you love. Just out of interest, who would unpack their bag? Who would have unpacked their bag? Yeah. 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 Most people, in yeah. fact. <laughs> Reality is most and people. So when AJ explained it to me, it's very logical what he's saying about love. If I really loved everyone in that circumstance, I would think of what's the best for everyone, not just my wallet. But I, would still, I still have respect for the money that we have. Now let me, but, let me even make it even yeah. more clear in terms of logic. Yeah. Right? Rather than love, you've got 200 people in a line. Right? How much does the average person earn in an hour? Let's say $30, shall we? It would be more than that. I mean, most, most businesses usually say it's around $50 because you know, they've got all the on costs and the taxation and all those other things involved with all of their costs. But let's say it's $30, right? The average person earns in an hour. There's 200 of those people. One hour is $6,000, is it not? That's one hour of their time. Now, if I use five minutes of their time, that's one twelfth of six thousand dollars what's one twelfth of six thousand dollars five hundred bucks is it yeah. yep so i've just wasted five hundred bucks of those collective people to save my own thirty dollars can you see that <laughs> i've wasted five hundred bucks to save my own thirty now that isn't even logical if i loved everybody and i viewed money the same in anybody's pocket as my own that is not a logical thing for me to do. But even I had more of a value on money than I did on time, on respect for the system, you know, respect for the person who was serving us. I, value, I felt I needed to be more loving about money than I needed to be respectful of the other factors that were in play in that situation. Now, for me and Mary, the situation was different because I had already gone through that emotion years before. The way I'd gone through it is through lots of different business transactions and realising the value value of time versus money rather than just valuing money but not only that um, I'd also gone through the pr phase of my life where I was earning quite a lot of money uh, up until you know up until I said oh Jesus and, I, I <laughs> <laughs> and, and much after that but um, that's, that's ironically what happened but uh, anyway um, so I was, I was using uh, in, in fact in some of the transactions I did I spent 20 hours of my time and earn $200,000. So that's $10,000 an hour. And I'm going, gee whiz, I've got 200 people behind me and they're earning $10,000 an hour. We're really stuffed here if we had to pay them back. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? So my feelings are very much along the lines of, my, like, it's not, I don't see money as, like, just of my own. Does that make sense? I see it as just a flowing thing between people. And so I'd work through that emotionally. So therefore I didn't have the same reaction to spending $30 than what Mary had. So rather than judging the reaction, what we've got to do is look at the fact, yeah, there's a whole series of background events based on family situations and everything that cause a person to have that particular belief system that then is unloving and demonstrated towards others. If we have a mic across there. Hey Jay, I've been in a situation where I've paid the $30 and then cursed myself. <laughs> <laughs> Self-punished. Exactly. <laughs> As a result, yeah, yeah. And, and my feeling is like, no, like, you, my feeling is you, you've also acknowledged the fact that actually the airline themselves has certain costs associated with having extra baggage and so forth. And you, you're actually acknowledging a lot of loving things in the process. So you know how here in Australia we don't have tipping much at all, right? You go over into the States and it's demanded of you. Is that loving? No, definitely not loving. Over in the States, they're like, they'll give you a receipt which has on the, on the bottom of it a calculated 15% tip. 
so that you know what the amount is to tip even. It's pretty unloving, that. But here in Australia, we do the opposite. We don't tip at all, generally, do we? Like, it's like, what was that again? $15.25. No worries, $15.25. You know, like, um, you know, oh, was it $14.95? Where's my five cents change? <laughs> right? And... Um, and so often when we go out, um, what happens if, I, if I'm really happy with the way we were served and, and like most of the time I'm really happy with the way we're served actually because uh, just the whole idea of sitting down and having a meal that somebody else serves you is a fantastic idea, isn't it? And, uh, and so like I, I'm usually pretty grateful for that but, but often, often I'm, um, because we eat vegan, you know, we often ask for modifications to the meals and everything and some people are just so great about it, like they're really good about it and I just feel like, you know, give them a big hug and here's an extra 20 bucks. And so what happens is that we often, I often tip people. And, and I find it quite remarkable sometimes when we go out with others because everyone goes, um, we're going to all pay for this individually or what? Whereas, as Mary knows with me, if you come out with me, basically, you get a meal for free. That's how it goes. <laughs> and, and, so, and so I'm going, oh, this is so interesting. I think I'll just sit back and watch what happens here. And they all walk up individually to the checkout, to the operator, right? And say, oh, what was on my meal? And they list all the things on their meal and the person has to add it all up. Now, this is really hard for the person behind the counter, don't you think? If you had to do that, and then you're left with free coffees, out, coffees outstanding. <laughs> Nobody owned up to taking their coffee, right? <laughs> so, that's, so, so that's why many of them now have a sign on their counter saying, no split bills, right? Because they have often been shortchanged by giving the service of splitting up the bill. And my feelings are just like, like how much was it? $30? Oh, here's 50 There you go. See you later. Like, it was a great meal. Thank you. Like, that, that's how I feel about it. Now, if you feel because of that that you shouldn't donate as much money, that's fine by me. Like, um, <laughs> does that make sense? My feelings are that that money, uh, money is an opportunity to demonstrate love to others, actually. And that's my feeling. And so it's, a, it's an opportunity. Many of us still need money to live, right? Unfortunately, that's the way the world is working at the moment. And being able to give a gift just because you enjoyed something. So, so if somebody enjoys something or, or they provide something to me that I really enjoy, it's really wonderful. I, usually, it's uh, an e there's extras coming their way it's, from me in that place. It's uh, great eating with AJ. You know, we stay at people's houses a lot, and a lot of people sit down and you know. Um, well, they first ask they, who's saying the prayer. You know, they wait for the prayer and the blessing on the food, and then <laughs> and I've still got the thing where I want everyone to be seated before I start eating. And AJ sits down, starts eating, goes. This is awesome. <laughs> and, like, and then if we're eating out, there's a big tip. And to me, that's him showing love and gratitude rather than if we all sat around and did a, yeah. a special blessing. Yeah. I, I just feel a lot of times that the emotion, you know, it's the emotion we feel from people that, that is its reward. Like love is an emotion, yeah? And, and when we display love in our lives, there will be an emotion coming out of us towards the person an emotion of appreciation, affection, kindness, compassion and understanding, but also this emotion of joy and optimism and, and all of those emotions come out of us in that place. And this is where, you know, these beliefs to me are very, very damaging because they, they, they the unfortunate thing about these beliefs is that they colour a person's entire experience about the world and love itself. And in fact, many people's lives who are... You, you think how many Christians, for example, and I'm not picking on them uh, in, in particular because there's many other religions too, how, how many Christians do believe that love is a sacrifice, for example, because they believe Jesus sacrificed and so therefore love is a sacrifice and then they live their entire life sacrificing and by the end of their life, many of them become so bitter about the sacrifice that's been unappreciated. Right? They're bitter. They're so bitter that it's eaten themselves up so much that many of them have passed with cancers and all sorts of other diseases because they feel so embittered by 
the whole concept that love is a sacrifice. And then they pass over in the spirit world and you know what happens? This is what I find the most saddest thing. Because they've believed love is a sacrifice and they've become so bitter, their soul is attracted to a location in darkness in the spirit world, not, not in brightness. Right? Because they're so bitter and resentful and that bitterness and resentfulness has now attracted them to a location in the spirit world that they didn't need to even arrive in if they had felt differently about love. And I feel, in fact, that most of the pain that is experienced in the spirit world by spirits who pass in poor condition is experienced because they've accepted in a lot of ways the belief systems on earth that are about love that are totally wrong. Right? Mm. And I find that is one of the saddest things I've personally observed in my life, watching generation upon generation upon generation of people who believe they're doing the right loving thing, passing over only to find that what they did has created so much resentment and bitterness and rage and anger within themselves that they're not in a location that's happy. And you know, I find that's one of the saddest f feelings that I feel when I think about how we learn all of these things about what the world believes love is, but that's actually not love. Yeah, and for me, one of the biggest truths that I've connected to in the last few years is that love is a gift, you know. In my family, there's a lot of sacrifice and expectation that is, that is uh, equated with being loving. And... Um, uh, I just remember realising that if, if I have an expectation that Igor treat me in a certain way and that's love uh, and that he should, <laughs> um, I can never fully receive a gift from him because I'm already demanding it from him. If I have no expectation and he treats me in a loving way, my heart is filled with this gift and the gratitude to have received something beautiful. Uh, if I'm already projecting at him an expectation that he should, then... If he gives it to me, that's good. And if he doesn't, I'm angry. But I never feel a gift ever in that, in that exchange. So, yeah, mm. it's a very beautiful thing. So what do you feel about that discussion? Does that challenge some of the investigative <laughs> nature in you to, to challenge some of these beliefs about love? Hopefully it has. And uh, it will allow you to sort of experiment with some of that. Yep. Uh, just with the mic. It's just coming down. Just a quick question back on the money issue. Um, what are your beliefs on tithing? Like, well, it's a demand. Yeah. So it's unloving. Yeah. It's a different if you desire to give the gift. If you but desire if to give ten percent of your earnings to somebody or something, that that's one thing. But for some, for that somebody or something to demand of you that you give ten percent, then that's a demand, and therefore it's unloving. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's quite simple. If you think about these points and you really start applying them in your life, you'll actually be able to very easily see what's loving, what's not loving. In almost every situation you can examine. And that's the beauty of understanding the truth about love, is that you can start working your way through a lot of un f false beliefs about, about love. And for me, it's been such a... Like, I used to think I would be weak, you know. If I let go of love is justice, then that makes me weak in the world. And the reverse has actually been the case. I feel more empowered and more. I have more faith in love and um, But it also makes more, you more firm, doesn't it? I don't know it? how and to explain it. It makes you stand up for truth and love yep. more than anything else without compromise but without being unloving. Without demand. Does it's that make sense? Does it, so it's just yeah. an amazing process. When yeah. I was hooked on justice, I was full of demands. And now, w letting go of the justice issue, I feel I'm more vocal about what's loving and what's not, um, what the truth is. But there's not the demand coming from me that people mm. must see this, they must accept this. Mm. Yeah. So hopefully you've enjoyed our time together today. I've enjoyed our time together with you. Um, it's been an awesome trip to yeah. Victoria, actually, guys. <laughs> <laughs> it's been an interesting Awesome in trip. a lot of ways. <laughs> yeah. um, so for those of you who weren't here a few weeks ago, we, we were here a few weeks ago and we gave some talks, uh, some talks on the Saturday two weeks ago and then on Tuesday night two weeks ago, around about. And then we went up to Albury for two days and then we went across to Mildura for a day and then we came back down here for today and we'll be, myself and Mary are going home Monday 
Uh, well, not home Monday because home is still in bits and pieces. So we're actually staying uh, on the Sunshine Coast for two or three days, which will be really hard, hey? And, uh, <laughs> and, and then we'll go home. And Did you do sarcasm? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Oh, I haven't had a swim for six months, so you know it's going to be really good. Um, so um, we during also in a couple of weeks' time we we're off to Greece, and what happened there was some friends of ours wanted us to come there, and we of course uh, spend all of our money, so we don't have any. <laughs> so they actually uh, paid for us to go there. So that's been really lovely for them, uh, for us, sorry, and uh, <laughs> and hopefully lovely for them, but who knows? <laughs> and. Uh, and so what we'll be doing in a couple of weeks' time is going to Athens. We'll be spending a bit of time there. And there's a whole group of people who are coming to the Worldwide Summit <laughs> <laughs> in Athens. Which uh, will probably basically. look a lot like this. A bunch of people in chairs with <coughs> yeah. free vegan food at the back. <laughs> yeah. And uh, one thing while we're looking forward to going there is that we've been there before. And obviously we've got quite a number of friends there now. And I'll so tell you the last time we were there, it was about three weeks after the incident in Tesco with the parsley from Israel. So I was in a really not a good place, you know. I, was, I just met AJ, everything was triggered. And I bet we met some really beautiful people and I'm really excited to go back and, yeah. and be more myself with them. Yeah. <laughs> um, will we come back to Melbourne? Well, that depends on desires. We respond, as I said earlier, we respond to the desires of a group of people. And, and I don't mean you saying you desire, I mean the feeling of desire coming from you. That's what we respond to. And so, so that just depends upon that. And what, also what happens over the next uh, six to eight months, um, uh, our spirit friends have indicated to us that uh, our lives are going to get a bit more busier, perhaps. Um, and if that's the case then both of us are a bit frightened of that because we like our privacy as well. So, so we're not sure how we're going to handle that and where, where that's going to lead uh, to us going. They've told us to keep a bag packed at all times, which means that we may just drop, you know, drop things at the drop of out, come over for a day or two to a place and then go home. Um, and if that's the case, then that'd be, that'd be fun too. So we'll just see how it goes. Um, but yeah, we'd love to see all of you again, of course. It's, re it's uh, really lovely coming to Melbourne. Yeah. I always feel a bit anxious, like, because it's a big city and we don't, we've only been here once before, is that right? Mm. And, it, and then I was quite anxious. We'd never met any of you before. And it was the same then. I, everyone was just very uh, open and welcoming. Everyone was willing to be fairly vulnerable with where they're at. And that is always really lovely for us because mm. we can respond to that. And that's why um, we talked for seven hours on that yeah. first day. Like, it was easy to it talk for seven hours. We weren't you know? tired, yeah. yeah. Whereas sometimes we go to a place and it gets quite difficult, in fact, to speak, even to speak, mm. because there's so much projection that you almost feel like, well, there's no point even opening your mouth, really. You know, that's how strong it gets at some places. Um, it's happening less so nowadays than, mm. than prior. Yes, yeah, sure. Um, I, know I know that you're on the web and that, and um, I'm just wondering, is there um, a way that people can ask questions? Not at the moment, no. Unfortunately, no. we're getting hundreds and hundreds of questions, you know, um, and also a lot of, like, there's a lot of abusive emails and all sorts of other things that have to be, mm. be sorted through to mm. find the people who are asking the questions. <laughs> yeah. um, so the um, ratio is about one to fifty. There's fifty yeah. yuckies and then one like one genuine who's question. Sincere, yeah, right. generally, and that's at the moment. That's since the media thing happened. Yeah. Um, so we're actually looking at maybe having a person or two who actually answers the inquiry line because normally myself and Mary have been doing that too. But we're not getting a chance to answer anything at the moment at all. Really, it's just like. Um, our own emotions, doing a seminar, then living our life, and then there's no time left to answer anything. So what we're trying to do is a number of different things to, to improve that. One is that we, we are looking for some people who are in a good condition of love to be able to answer the general questions that are asked. Which would come to inquiry at divinetruth.com. Yep. So there's a lot of general questions like, you know, about... about uh, what do you believe about 
homosexuality, you know? For example. People... Yeah. yeah, we had a lovely gay man actually yeah. email us that question last week. Um, and uh, so we'd love to respond to those kind of questions. And th then there's other questions that people send to us that are far more personal. Now, to, to respond to a personal question written is a very difficult process because actually... Um, to do it, you've got to type up a very long-winded explanation of what's going on for them individually. And so it's very, very hard for us to actually give a, a, a written response. It might take an hour, and then or if you've longer. got 20 of them... Can I ask a question now? Or would it's you like far better to ask a question <laughs> in... Can I just, before you do, just tell you a couple of other ways that we're trying to work on this issue? Yeah, because it's good for everyone um, to know. Yep. We're trying to start a frequently asked questions page on the website. So, because we, there are yeah. frequently asked questions, so we're going to try and respond to some of them in written form for so everyone to see. So, if we find like five people ask the same question, and often we feel that there's a lot of people who want to know the answer to that question, we will type up myself or Mary will type up a response to that question, and then somebody will post that onto the internet on, on the frequently asked questions page. There is another project that's been going for a while which is indexing the talks. So obviously there's a general title for the talk or the seminar that AJ or AJ and myself have given, but in amongst that often we get a random question about, you know, parenting, homosexuality, you know, just thrown into what is love. And where there are a group of volunteers, I don't know where they're at at the moment, but they have been working on indexing the talks to say he talks about homosexuality in this talk, this talk, this talk, and this talk. And at this time. <coughs> at so this, this time. At this minute and this second, which is quite a hard job, as you can imagine. But you can, very valuable, as you can imagine, because then if you think, I wonder what about this issue, you can go to some place on the website and go, oh, I can find it in these places and listen to those things. Now, all of the people <coughs> who are providing these services also do it all for free. So, in so their own time. In their own time. So, so of course, you know... Um, it takes time to set up a lot of these particular things when everybody's doing it as, as a part of their spare time, if you like. But I also rely on your law of attraction, you know. If you really want to know an answer about something and you don't have access to us, pray about it and go and go to your range of DVDs and pick out the one you're drawn to. A lot of people do that and find their find question is answered away. that way. Yeah. The other thing to do is to remember this is not a relationship between you, you and I, myself and Mary. Yeah. This is a relationship between you and God. And what I've learnt to do with that relationship is to go to God first with every single thing I have, every single question I have. Every single question, there's a general process that I follow, and that is, firstly, I go to God with a desire to know the answer, and then also for a desire to know the answer over the next few days, a desire to see the answers being given to me in that period of time, and to, and to acknowledge them inside of myself. And when I do that, it's totally unfailing that I don't get an answer usually within a day or two days. All right. For most people, the issue for all of us is the desire for the answer. Even sometimes when we're asking the question, we don't really know if we want the answer yet. Mm. So, <laughs> so a lot of times a person puts out the question and says, um, what about parenting this way? And the real question is, I parent pretty good. Please tell me that I do. <laughs> you know, that, that's really the question. <laughs> and, and often I say, well, I'm sorry, but I have to disagree. And then they get all upset with me because they didn't really want to know the answer to that question. So, yeah, I agree. Once I really desire the answer to something, usually it comes to me, I don't even need a DVD. It, I'm shown pretty quickly. Yeah. So, yeah. so my suggestion for everyone is uh, we know that at times it, uh, you get a bit stuck in your, in your moving forward, in your relationship with God. And my suggestion to you is to pray about that r really sincerely. And remember, a prayer is not like our Father in <laughs> heaven, you know, hallowed be thy name. It's it's a longing from your soul to know something, to know the answer or to feel the answer, but a longing for you to know it from a loving perspective, not from your own perspective. You see, most of the time we want to see things from our own perspective and not from a loving perspective. So if you do that, you'll find that you'll very rapidly receive answers if you're open to receiving them. And if you're not receiving them, then my fir the first thing I do when I'm not receiving them is I go, well, I mustn't be very open to receiving it. Don't really want 
want to know. So yet. there must be yeah. something wrong here. Why, why don't I want to know the answer to this particular question? Like, God always. One thing I said in the first century that's really worth remembering about God, and we need to have some sessions soon about God's true nature. But this is one thing about God's true nature: God always responds to a loving request. There's never a time when God doesn't respond to a loving request. So if I feel like I'm not getting a response, it's because there's something unloving usually involved with it that I need to look at. And, and if you allow yourself to feel about that, you often find the answers. So rather than answering your question now, if you could pro try that process over the, over the coming week or so on this question that you have that you want to ask and see what happens. The law of attraction, which is the law that God has created to bring things to your soul to purify it, the law of attraction is a very powerful law that your soul has at your disposal at every single moment of your life. And that is the fast way, it is, I feel, God's messenger of truth to you individually. Every single one of us can utilise that messenger, um, but we, of course, often have struggle understanding it. That's the issue. Anyway, we'd like to thank you for your time. We realise your time everyone. is precious, so yeah. thank you. We would like uh, also to thank Anto and Jane for providing this uh, for three nights, three days. Uh, we want. We need to thank Joy for organising everything to do with the DVDs. The DVDs. This entire yep. trip. Joy's. So. All of the DVDs that you've got there, Joy's packaged up and done all of that. So please don't forget to, if you haven't got a copy, to take, don't forget to take, uh, we love you. You can take the whole lot of one pack. <laughs> you know, you don't have to say, oh, I can only take one. You can take the whole lot. And if you find that it's not for you, then perhaps give it away to somebody who it is to, rather than destroy them. Because all of those packs were given through the donations of other people. Does that make sense? And if you can just honour that. And we'd like to thank Igor and Lena for their work as well. Thank you, guys. Igor and Lena drove our car from Queensland, full of sound equipment, to every location pretty much that we've been visiting. And, and I did a bit of driving as well, but um, Igor and Lena drove it all down. So without that, we would have no sound equipment here or, or, or the ability oh, to record yep. any of it. And Igor has also been placing on the internet, on YouTube, a lot of the presentations, a lot, some of them from last a few weeks ago are already there actually. It, um, last two Saturdays ago and last Tuesday night is definitely there. And Aubrey's not there yet, I don't think, is it? No. So, so Igor's pretty on the ball when it comes to getting things uploaded, so it's just wonderful. And we've also given... Um, what, what, we do, what we do is if people are helping us pretty full-time, and some people are now, we are actually putting a description on the internet of those persons. Like, so with Igor and Lena, we've done that. And a description of, you know, what they've been doing. And then we're also a way to donate to them... Directly. Directly. Yeah. So that if you want to thank them for the work that they're doing, it's a way, there's a mechanism there to donate to them directly. Does that make sense? So anyway, we'd like to thank you so much for your time and we've enjoyed your company. We look forward to seeing you again at some point. Yeah, I hope and to see you soon. Yeah, yeah. and uh, I hope you enjoy your time experimenting with love over the coming months. Love and yeah. desire. So, yeah. Thanks, guys. Feel free to leave whenever you wish. <laughs>